morning and welcome to another episode of the Maxwell Institute's Book of Mormon Studies podcast. Today we are talking about the scholarly literature on First Nephi, and I'm joined today by a terrific guest, uh, Jasmine Jimenez Rappoli. Jasmine is the Director of Communications at Scripture Central. And she's, her face and voice are probably familiar to those who know the Scripture Plus app. She runs all the social media for Scripture Plus. Um, she's a great communicator. She knows and loves the Book of Mormon. And I'm so happy that she's with us this morning. Welcome, Jasmine. Thanks for having me. This is really exciting. I feel honored to be here. Yes. So I have um, a couple of goals for our episode today. Uh, this is the first time this year that we've done an episode of the podcast that focuses on scholarly work around the Book of Mormon. So I'm hoping that by the end of our conversation today, three things will have happened. First of all, I hope listeners are aware that there is, in fact, scholarship around the Book of Mormon. There's quite a lot of scholarship. There's a growing field um, that has been going on for in some form or another for almost a century and really has professionalized over the last 40 years or so. Um, so I, I hope to introduce readers to that field um, and give them a sense for what kind of scholarly work can and does happen um, in relation to the Book of Mormon. Second of all, I hope to demystify it. I hope that people feel empowered by our conversation um, and are interested in perhaps diving into it. There's so much available online through the great work of, of Scripture Central, um, the Maxwell Institute, the Interpreter Foundation, um, lots of resources that people can, can go to online and can, for themselves, get in up to their elbows in this emerging scholarly literature. And finally, I, I hope that we leave readers and listeners um, with... Uh, some specific insights into this book of First Nephi, a better understanding of what Nephi is trying to accomplish here, how the text is put together, um, and in particular, um, how it can lead us to Christ. So with those ideas in mind, let's jump right in, Jasmine, to our discussion. You are going to start us off today by talking about um, some background and context that might be able to help us as we start our study of the Book of Mormon, in particular, this book, Glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem. Tell us about this. Awesome. Well, it is <clears throat> quite a behemoth of a work. I love this volume when it comes to the beginning of the Book of Mormon year, because there's just a lot of pieces going on when you enter the pages of the Book of Mormon. Um, we know a lot of the Book of Mormon takes place in an ancient American setting, but when you first open up, it takes place in Jerusalem at a very uh, disruptive and chaotic point in history. And it can be a little hard to get your bearings on what's going on. What are the motivations here? Why is Lehi in Jerusalem? Why are they leaving Jerusalem? Why are people upset about him prophesying certain things? And so this volume um, is a little bit older. It came out in 2004, but it's really a an important work in helping to situate you in what you're trying to understand when you open those first few pages. And what's, there are a lot of different ways to approach the text, but I really like starting with a historical approach because I feel like it will help you to interpret the text better, um, or at least in a more informed way for its ancient audience. So the Book of Mormon presents itself as an ancient text and the authors present themselves as being from Jerusalem originally, and then later on in ancient America. And so part of interpreting the text um, is, you know, doing an exegesis on it, as we would say in biblical scholarship. And so to do that for the Book of Mormon, we've got to kind of get our bearings on, okay, who are the main players? Where is this taking place? What's going on in the background that informs the motivations behind these authors and what they're trying to convey? And that really is what Glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem is trying to do. Um, I was just uh, talking to my husband this morning. We definitely could use an update since it's quite a bit um, older to give us the most recent scholarship on what was happening at the time. But when we look at 600-ish BC Jerusalem, there are a lot of different uh, factions, political factions, cultural rifts going on, and Lehi is stuck right in the middle of it. And so this really helps to clarify and demystify a lot of that so that you can kind of feel comfortable going into Lehi's world and going into Nephi's world and understanding what this is all about. Um, and so this book has 
um, chapters from BYU professors covering all sorts of aspects of Lehigh's world at this time. There's a chapter kind of situating you into the culture of Jerusalem, you know, what people ate, what they wore, um, what the weather was like, all of those things. There's a chapter on kind of the political dynamics at the time. There's one on women's roles in ancient Israel at the time. And there's one on um, like Lehi and Egyptian influence, since we know that the Book of Mormon is written in uh, by the language of the Jews and the learning. Or no, sorry, it's opposite. The language. Wait, now I can't remember. Is it the language of the Jews and the learning of the Egyptians, or the, vice the versa? Learning, the learning of the Jews and the learning language of, of the Jews, Egyptians. Language yes. of the Egyptians. I always get those mixed up. And later on, they refer to that as Reformed Egyptian in the text. And so there's, you know, discussion about well, what does that mean? What would that look like for them? Um, and so it's really, really, really wonderful. And so I always go back to this book when we come to the Book of Mormon year so that I can kind of refresh on what uh, what's going on at the time. Uh, but it's a big book. So I'm just going to kind of narrow in on a couple pieces. Um, one that I find really interesting is a piece by Jeffrey Chadwick called Lehi's House at Jerusalem and the Land of His Inheritance. And um, it sounds like a pretty niche topic, and it kind of is, but I find it really helpful because there's a little bit of a dissonance in the text when we're introduced to Nephi, or sorry, not to Nephi, to Lehi. When we're introduced to Lehi, we learn that he is of the tribe of Manasseh, and yet he's living in Jerusalem. And uh, for anyone who knows at least something about the biblical world, that seems odd because traditionally Jews and the tribe of Judah would be in Jerusalem in the south, and then all of those other tribes, including Manasseh, lived in northern Israel. So what's Lehi doing in Jerusalem? In the early 1800s or in the 1830s, when the Book of Mormon first came out, it was a point of criticism that, oh, clearly this shows that Joseph Smith didn't know what he was talking about because someone from the tribe of Manasseh would never have lived in Jerusalem. Uh, but Jeffrey Chadwick goes through and provides some context and background to why this might be the case. Basically, he goes into the political situation at the time that um, you have major powers competing over this land of Israel. Israel is kind of the crossroads between multiple major world powers. You've got Egypt in the south, you've got Assyria in the north. Later on, Babylon kind of takes over and Israel is standing right in between those. And so Israel tends to be a place where a lot of battles and wars are end up being fought. <clears throat> and during one of the um during one of these uh captivities the Assyrians came in with Sennacherib and did kind of a first deportation of northern Israel. And then again, in 701 BC, you've got another uh, siege on Jerusalem itself, in addition to other places in southern Judah. And at this time, there's a lot of disruption and people are um, taken away to Assyria, but not everyone is taken away to Assyria. You have a lot of people left in Israel. And at this time, we find kind of a migration of refugees into the land and area of Judah. And so the proposal and the idea is that, well, Lehi may have been one of these refugees, or if not Lehi, his father, or maybe his grandfather, depending on, um, you know, what chronology you're following. So it kind of gives you a sense of of setting that Lehi is not just a prophet in a vacuum. He has a pedigree and a history, a family history of fleeing, of being a refugee, of having to be displaced from his home to um, settle in Jerusalem where he currently is. And it also helps to kind of give you a little bit of, um, it helps you to understand what Lehi is talking about with the um, slaying of Laban narrative. When Lehi has his family go back to Jerusalem, uh, Lehi sends his sons to just go off and do whatever they can to get the plates. And one of their options is let's go to the land of our inheritance and get all of our possessions and try to essentially bribe or purchase the plates from Laban. And um, when we read land of inheritance, I think we most of us just assume they're just going to their house in Jerusalem. But Based on Jeffrey Chadwick's article, it leaves open the possibility that the real land of their inheritance is actually up in the north, that it's somewhere where Lehi's family originated from. And so maybe, I mean, it's just a possibility that they actually had to take quite the trek in order to um, redeem some of the possessions of the land of their inheritance in order to bring back to Jerusalem. It's just a possibility, but it opens up several 
uh, ideas and avenues for shifting your picture of what this first, what these first few chapters are like. Um, I know I grew up uh, watching living scriptures a lot. And so that's kind of a very cemented visual image of what (laughs) these narratives are. But when you actually try to reevaluate what the political situation was, what the historical situation was, all of a sudden that picture shifts a lot. And so you're having to reconstruct what the getting to get the blast brass plates was all about what lehigh and jerusalem was all about and it helps you to interpret the text in new ways so that's just a one little tidbit from glimpses of lehigh's jerusalem but like i said it's got a lot of chapters it's got a lot of uh, rich resources for helping you understand that historical context a little better yeah yeah that's great there were there were two things that really struck me as I was reviewing this book in preparation for this podcast. One is just um how unique this these first chapters of first Nephi really are these first ten chapters or so where we have a determinate context for the events of of the Book of Mormon. Um, we know that they took place in Jerusalem. We know when they took place. Um, and because that is known history, we can we can co- coordinate um, and corroborate the details of the text with the with the known history. Of course, once they move into the wilderness and then once they migrate across the ocean into the the, the land of promise, of course we lose that sort of determinate context. And so that um, a, a different kind of of scholarship and inference is necessary at that point. Um, but during these first early chapters, there's there's a vast world of known history. History, of course, um, is, is itself always a, a moving target as a scholarly field and new discoveries are made. Um, but there's a lot that we know about the context. And so it's a pretty special um, moment in the Book of Mormon where we can do this kind of scholarship. The second um, thing that if you really... don't mind me um, dovetailing on that, I think yeah. what you mentioned there is really critical that because it's determinant, we've had a lot of, we've been able to do a lot of historical scholarship. And that's yeah. really influenced the trajectory that the scholarly field has taken in so many ways, because it's a determinant point when scholars in the 1950s and 60s are asking, well, what can we know about the Book of Mormon? They're like, well, we know it took place in Israel, so let's start there. And a lot of our scholars from you know the middle of the 20th century, that's where they got their training in, in ancient Near Eastern studies and biblical studies. And so they're trying to take that lens and apply it to the Book of Mormon in order to draw insights from it and in order to try to understand it better. And so we have a disproportionate amount of scholarship on the biblical setting of the Book of Mormon and not nearly as much on like a new world setting for the Book of Mormon. And as you've mentioned, literary theological uh, lenses for viewing the text as well has been a little bit more light handed. Um, And part of the restraints for understanding the Book of Mormon in a New World historical setting are, like you said, it's indetermined, so we can't really put a pin in the map and say, let's start digging there. It's more speculative. We just have to guess. Um, But even if we were to speculate and say, okay, well, maybe it took place in like Central America somewhere, um, because we don't have direct pins in the map, it's so much harder to to create a very definite cultural context for interpreting the text. And we have a dearth of Latter-day Saint scholarship in that area in general. We've got great scholars who have done work in ancient Mesoamerica, ancient North America, ancient South America, um, but they're just barely starting to scratch the surface of interacting in Book of Mormon studies in some ways um, based on constraints of their own field and um, just not as much attention has been driven there. So personally, I would love to see a lot more attention in the scholarship on an ancient American setting moving forward. But as we'll, I'm sure, talk about later, there are other ways to view the text than just from a historical setting. And those provide fresh ways for us to interpret and glean insights from the text. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Another point to be made is that um, as we think about contextualizing the Book of Mormon in this ancient biblical world, we should think about not just kind of the, um, the hard history of geography and politics and culture and um, lived experience, what life was like on the ground. But the great insight of Hugh Nibley was that we should also think about contextualizing it and historicizing it in the language, the poetry, and the discourse of the ancient world. And I think that's where things really took off kind of in, in the mid-century of the, of the 20th century with Hugh Nibley, his insight that we can look inside the Book of Mormon for 
literary forms um, and for corroboration in ancient texts um, as much as in ancient archaeology. So that textual angle, that historical textual angle, um, would prove to be extremely crucial for the shape of Book of Mormon studies going forward through that second half of the 20th century. The other thing that really struck me in this volume, Glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem, is the importance of Jerusalem as a theological idea at the time um, that Lehi and his family came out. Um, Jerusalem was not just kind of a political center, but it was the theological and the sacrificial um, and um, the cultural center for Jewish people of the time. And during all of the upheaval that you described in the century or so before the, the events of the Book of Mormon open, um, Jerusalem had been at the center of these warring empires. And there had grown up this idea, sometimes called Zion theology, that Jerusalem was inviolable and that it could never fall and that God had made these promises to David and then reiterated in Isaiah that somehow um, Jerusalem could never fall. And I think we see the reverberations of that idea throughout these early chapters of First Nephi, as it's so difficult for not only the, the Jewish people in, uh, in Jerusalem, as Lehi prophesied to them of the, the coming destruction of their city, but Laman and Lemuel themselves, right? The, 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 the pull of Jerusalem as the center of their world, um, the, the, the one stable point in their cosmos. And to imagine that falling is really unthinkable. And what Lehi and Nephi ask them to do is to imagine that their stable point is not actually the city of Jerusalem. It is their connection to the Lord. And that that connection to the Lord is mobile. It can travel. Um, they can continue to receive new light and direction from the Lord wherever they are, in the wilderness, across the sea in a new land. Um, th this is really asking them to shift their worldview in a very, very fundamental way. Um, so I, I think we can see that conflict play out through these early chapters here. Um, oh, for sure. Nephi. I mean, I think, I mean, Latter-day Saints can relate to this sentiment as well as we've, you know, the Latter-day Saints built a temple in Kirtland for the first time. And this is, you know, Zion. This is where God's going to dwell. And if, time and time again, we saw that fall through as we were pushed out and had to be more mobile. And so we can definitely understand where Laman and Lemuel are coming from there. And um, when it comes to Jerusalem, they say, you know, we know that Jerusalem can't be destroyed. And there's there's good reason for that, because, I mean, in the history, we know that Jerusalem, well, Jerusalem had been attacked before, but as recently as like 701 BC, about 100-ish years before Lehi's time, you've got Sennacherib from Assyria coming in and decimating a lot of the area of Judah. And we have evidence for that in certain ancient documents like the Lachish letters talking about the destruction that Assyria um, implemented there. But when it comes to Jerusalem, we have some conflicting accounts. Uh, Sennacherib himself leaves an account in Assyria about how he oh yeah, I left Jerusalem like a bird in a cage. I basically like trapped them there. But in the Bible, we get an account where there's a divine deliverance of Jerusalem, where even though Sennacherib got close, he couldn't actually take Jerusalem. And so from an Israelite's perspective, who believes in a God of miracles, they see that as Jerusalem is the place. Jerusalem's where the temple is. God is with Jerusalem. Jerusalem cannot fall. So when it comes to Laman and Lemuel, they definitely have reason to think that Jerusalem is inviolable, like you said, and they have to shift a massive paradigm to realize that, oh, we can, we need to travel and we can travel like the Israelites did in the wilderness and God will be with us there too. Yeah. So, so this type of scholarship, we could say this kind of historical and contextual scholarship, it might be fair to say that it starts in some ways outside of the text of the Book of Mormon. Of course, these scholars have read the Book of Mormon and are familiar with um, with it with its contents to begin with. But then they look outside um, into the, the context, whether that be, as I mentioned, the historical context or the linguistic context, um, and they bring insights from there to bear on the text and then use 
that light to make sense of what we see happening in the Book of Mormon. So it's a movement from kind of outside the text to inside the text of the Book of Mormon. Let's talk now about maybe a different style of scholarship, one that starts inside the text and is mostly rooted in a close reading of the text itself and making sense of what's happening there in relation to itself. Um, And a really good Uh, and rather classic example of this kind of scholarship is um, from an eminent scholar in Book of Mormon Studies, Noel Reynolds. And he wrote an article called The Political Dimension of Nephi's Small Plates. Walk us through this article, Jasmine, and help us see what um, Reynolds is arguing and, and his method. How does he make his argument? Sure. So this one came out in BYU Studies in 1987. So it's definitely an old article, um, but it Uh, was pretty foundational for other treatments that have come since then, kind of tackling a very similar idea that um, when you read the Book of Mormon, specifically the small plates, you maybe should question your assumptions about what you take at face value. What's really going on here? Um, It's very easy to see first Nephi as a very black and white narrative between good guys and bad guys. Nephi is the continually righteous son and his gosh darn it bad brothers Laban and Lemuel are always getting in the way and Laban Laban's a bad guy who just gets in the way and it's all about Nephi's struggle to conquer and overcome and be this righteous example to his brothers as they go to the promised land and Noel Reynolds kind of takes that narrative and helps you rethink those assumptions about what's really going on here and He doesn't villainize Nephi by any stretch, but he helps readers to understand why Nephi is writing his account in the first place. He's not telling a dispassionate documentary of what happened. He's writing this 30 plus years after the fact where he is now in the new world. He's established as the ruler over the Nephite people after he's split off from his brothers and Um, there clearly was a big rift there and there's a lot of tension in that division of the families. And now Nephi is trying to uh, convince his people or rather reestablish to his people that he is the legitimate ruler over his people and he is chosen by God to do so. And so you can see hints throughout the text where he is not manipulating the narrative, but trying to definitely show his side of the story to demonstrate how, yeah, all along God chose me. All along, I've been trying to do my best to be the ruler and Laman and Lemuel. Uh, here are all the ways that Laman and Lemuel have fallen short of that. And that's why I, as the younger brother, ended up taking over. So it's almost like a persuasive essay from Nephi to demonstrate his right to rule. And we see this in the ancient world a lot. We, you've got uh, narratives of kings ascending to the throne, and they're always going to tell a very deliberate narrative about why they have the divine right to rule over their competitors or opponents. And so that's what we see Noel Reynolds doing in this article. And uh, he takes very specific uh, elements that, you know, Nephi has multiple times throughout his text where he has time and time again, um, these same elements play out where God gives a commandment and he gives a sign to Nephi that he's chosen by God and his brothers murmur and Nephi prevails after all. And these elements repeat over and over again, first with the um, retrieval of the brass plates, then again, when they go back to get the uh, family of Ishmael, then again, when he's trying to build the ship, then again, when they're crossing the ocean. So you've got these recurring cycles, if you will, where these events and these little vignettes of stories occur, and the same elements of God choosing Nephi, Nephi choosing the right, Laman and Lemuel falling short of choosing the right, but eventually getting on board and then being blessed because of it cycle over and over and over again to demonstrate time and time again that Nephi is the legitimate ruler of his people. He is, he has the political right to rule. He has the spiritual right to rule. And he was given that by God to just demonstrate his, uh, his hegemony over his people. So um, that one's a really interesting one because it will make you rethink pretty much everything you think you know about first Nephi. You've got to check, okay, why is Nephi giving us this detail? Did this really happen? Well, there's good reason it did, but, um, but why is he including this specifically? Why is he telling it this way? Why isn't he including, you know, the other side of the story? So it, it helps you just think a little bit more critically as a reader. And this approach has then been uh, revisited several times with, 
uh, subsequent scholars like Grant Hardy has kind of gone into deconstructing the small plate narrative and Joseph Spencer with his brief theological introductions. And we see that a lot. So uh, lots of uh, lots of potential for bearing fruit when it comes to analyzing these texts with a fine tooth comb. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you that he was uh, prescient in some ways um, in recognizing that we can start from inside the text, and in particular, we can start from the motivations of the narrator, and we can infer what those motivations would have been, and then we can use that as a lens to make sense of what was chosen, what was chosen to include. Every single um, word, every single sentence, um, every single incident, um, is the result of an editorial and authorial choice. So why is it that in this case, Nephi made the choice to include such and such an event to portray such and such a character in this way? Well, maybe we have a unifying overarching lens that can help us make sense of that. And in this case, Reynolds suggests that it it could be Nephi's need, as you say, to legitimate um, his heirship. As the younger son, he is still the legitimate heir of Lehi. Um, and as you as you pointed out, this is this is so important because over time, the Lamanites and the Nephites develop these competing founding narratives of how the the family of Lehi came to the New World, what those events were, um, and in some ways they're kind of diametrically opposed, right? The Lamanites see um, the Nephites. Uh, see Nephi as having Nephi and Lehi as having been responsible for driving the family wrongfully out of Jerusalem, um, of having um, wrongfully seized political power in the wilderness. Um, the, the Lamanites see Nephi as having wrongfully seized political power in the wilderness and across the sea. And then again, in the land of the first inheritance, where Nephi eventually will see leaves with his people and takes the brass plates with him. Um, and so it's it's necessary for Nephi to maintain the legitimacy, not only, of course, of um, of Nephite rule um, over their own people, but also of their um, messianic claims as well. Right. This is a point that that Reynolds makes, I think, is a good one. Um, the records, the brass plates and Nephi's writings are the repository of the Nephites. Um, legitimizing religious and political claims. They're both religious and political because Nephi's claim to legitimate rule is tied to his acceptance of the messianic revelations, right? The revelations that that Christ would come. So this is both religious and political. Um, and we can say, well, hang on, you know, the, the purpose of the Book of Mormon is to convince people that Jesus is the Christ. Um, and that's true. And for Nephi, in order to convince people that Jesus was the Christ, as Reynolds see it, that entails that the Nephites um, had legitimate um, claim to political and religious authority. And in all of this, uh, we see how important records are, right? The, the records are the, are the place where um, these claims are codified, where they're preserved, um, and how they can be passed along from generation to generation. So as we see the importance of the records um, in uh, throughout First Nephi, we have these moments where Nephi will pop in and say, just a reminder, I'm writing these records myself with my own hand, and I'm doing it for, for these important reasons. Um, we can understand why um, proving the provenance of the records is so crucial for Nephi throughout, throughout these chapters. And these records have multivalent significance throughout the text, but one of which is a very tangible and physical symbol of being like an emblem of kingship, that he has possession of the brass plates. But in addition to the brass plates, he has the sword of Laban, he's got the Liahona. And so these end up kind of being emblems of kingship for him to additionally legitimize him as the ruler. We see this in other cultures as well, where in order to be, you know, officially coronated as king, you get certain emblems, you get scepter, crown, staff. I mean, we even just saw vestiges of that this last year when King Charles was crowned king in May of 2023 in England. And we kind of got to see a lot of those accoutrements of ritual. And the same thing happened in the ancient world where you've got these emblems of kingship that legitimize your right to rule. And so when Nephi 
absconds with these emblems, he's also saying that I have the right to rule. And that kind of fuels, like you mentioned in the book of Mosiah, the Lamanites counter narrative that we were dragged out of Jerusalem. We, we were wrongfully usurped of the rulership. And also we were robbed. Nephi stole those sacred emblems that legitimize both our political authority and our religious authority, that we have the right to, as you mentioned, like the revelations from God, this messianic airship, that we are the ones that inherit that divine chosen of godness. Yeah, that's right. And and so important are sort of these these stories and beliefs in the foundation of the the Nephite and Lamanite peoples that for for Nephites at least the acceptance of that narrative of Nephi's legitimacy that pretty much constitutes Nephite identity. So we see again and again through the Book of Mormon, Nephite dissenters who leave the Nephites. And almost always, it's because they dispute. They've come to dispute those founding narratives. Um, and and once, they, once they reject those narratives, in the eyes of the remaining Nephites, they become like Lamanites. They have left the Nephite people. Um, so acceptance of, again, both the political claims and the religious claims that Christ will come um, are, are central to Nephite self-identity and group identity. For sure. Well, as you, as you mentioned, um, Jasmine, uh, Reynolds wrote this wonderful article um, in 1987, or that's when it was published. Um, and then it, so it was, let's see, um, over 20 years later, when this book came out, Understanding the Book of Mormon by Grant Hardy. I'm not sure for my video watchers whether that will be backwards or forwards, but this is the book, <laughs> Understanding the Book of Mormon, A Reader's Guide by Grant Hardy. Um, and Hardy takes a method that is similar to Reynolds in the sense that he starts from inside the text. Um, and he uses the motivations uh, and the intentions of the principal narrators of the Book of Mormon, who are Nephi, Mormon, and Moroni, um, as the lens to make sense of why and what is happening in the Book of Mormon. Um, hit, this was a groundbreaking work. One of the reasons why understanding the Book of Mormon was so novel um, is that Hardy had did have a slightly different intention than Reynolds. I think Reynolds was largely writing for Latter Day Saints and believers in uh, in the Book of Mormon as I am and as you are. Uh, and this this podcast is primarily intended for, for those who um, are believers in the Book of Mormon. Uh, Hardy is a believer in the Book of Mormon, but he wanted to find a way to place the Book of Mormon before non-believers in a way that could garner respect and interest. And in particular, he wanted to create a language where people who believe in the Book of Mormon and who don't can both talk in a constructive way about the text. Before that time, when believers and non-believers would talk, it would often just degenerate into arguments about truth claims around Joseph Smith's legitimacy um, as, as a modern day prophet. Uh, and the context, the actual content of the Book of Mormon was often ignored um, in, the, in those arguments, not always, but often it would be just simply ignored. Um, and so Hardy found this really rather brilliant way um, to create a space where all interested readers of good faith and goodwill could come and talk constructively together about the Book of Mormon. And his realization was that you can start with the narrators because the study of narration and narrative devices is suitable for both history, like the Book of Mormon, as believers in the Book of Mormon see it, and for fiction as non-believers in the Book of Mormon would see it, for both insiders and outsiders. They both can ask, why did Book of Mormon prophets write the way they did? What kinds of experiences and motivations and personalities uh, might have resulted in the narrative as we have it in the Book of Mormon now? What did they choose to omit? What did they choose to include and why? So, uh, Hardy is asking the same kinds of questions, and he's using a similar method starting from inside the text of the Book of Mormon, but he's doing it with a slightly um, broader intention here. 
even for those of us like you and me, Jasmine, who um, accept the Book of Mormon as the Word of God and as historical and who accept uh, uh, Nephi and Mormon and Moroni as real people, um, we can still learn so much from Grant Hardy's work um, and his approach to the Book of Mormon. And as you say, it really um, dovetails, his reading of First Nephi dovetails really quite nicely with Reynolds' reading of the Book of Mormon. Um, he, makes, he makes a couple of important points. Um, first of all, he points out that Nephi's genre is didactic narrative. When I say genre, I mean the kind of writing that Nephi is wanting to produce is didactic narrative, not realism, not psychological realism in the way that as modern readers we might expect to see. So when we come to the text and we see what might seem as sort of one-dimensional characterizations of Laman and Lemuel, there might be something inside of us is that, hold on, most people are are more than that, right? They're not these kind of one-dimensional villains. Um, and a true kind of realistic psychological portrait of Laman and Lemuel would be much richer. That's probably the case. But we have to remember that Nephi isn't going for psychological realism. He is trying to teach us something. Um, and his his um, effort to to his rhetorical efforts to persuade us um, are paramount. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, the second is that Nephi's method in these small plates is a subtractive method. So he started with the large plates, the full account um, that of sort of his his reign and um, and the ways in the the history by which the political uh, um, state, I don't know if state is the right word, but the, the political body of the Nephites came to be. Um, he starts with that full account in the large plates, and then he takes things out um, to shorten it and make this more condensed, abridged account in the small plates that focuses only, especially on the things of the ministry. So what that means is that we can ask questions about what gets left out and why. And we can infer motivations and reasons, and, and these inferences um, can shed a lot of light on what we see happening here in First Nephi. So um, Hardy argues that Nephi deliberately draws these portraits of Laman and Lemuel so as to dissuade us as the reader from taking their point of view seriously. It's it's important that as readers we we identify with Nephi um, and we come to accept his um, political claims, but also and paramount his religious claims about um, the coming of Christ and his um, his prophecies, especially about the redemption of Israel in the last days. Yeah, um, and yeah. if I can just uh, butt in, I think it's. A really important point that you made about approaching the text from the text in so that we, you can draw common ground with other people. Um, you uh, at the Maxwell Institute are more in the you know Mormon studies academic world and so you have a slightly different audience whereas I am very staunchly an apologetic world where I'm constantly trying to help people who are struggling with their faith and so the constant question is is this true and so that is a frequent question that is right in the forefront that we're always trying to answer. Is this true? Is this true? Is this true? And and so we're doing some triage in some ways and trying to help people with that question. But when people who are struggling get so hung up on, is it true? They really can miss the beauty and the content of the Book of Mormon. And then they're not getting touched by the message, which is where the power of the Book of Mormon really is, is that this is a testament of Jesus Christ. It is the word of God. It has the power to transform lives and to change hearts. And when we're so fixated on, is it true? Is it true? Is it true? Um, and you get bogged down in the doubts and questions of that, you can miss that. And so I love that what Grant Hardy does is he kind of helps to just open that door to say, let's just not worry about that for now, but let's look at the text as literature. Let's look at the text and see what we can discover and find out that it's sophisticated. It's beautiful. It has a lot of richness and depth to it as he explores in this narrative with Nephi. And, you know, how does that make you feel? What does that make you think about the Book of Mormon? And that can open doors to understanding the message more about the Book of Mormon. And like you mentioned, he has a very specific perspective of, of Nephi, and he's trying to kind of peel back and deconstruct the layers of what Nephi is doing here. And um, I did find as I refreshed my um, reading of Grant Hardy, I found 
on my first time when I read it, I thought it was just like really um, paradigm shifting. And I thought it was so brilliant. And this time I found myself thinking it was a little bit more skeptical or cynical of Nephi than I personally have come around to thinking these days. But it still is such an important thing to help us peel back those layers of what's Nephi trying to do so that we can then reconstruct. And how does this build our testimony of Jesus Christ? How does this actually, I mean, is he persuasive? Did Nephi succeed in persuading you that Jesus is the Christ? And if so, then, you know, he accomplished his goals. And I think that's an important thing to remember as well. But um, yeah. anyway, sorry to kind of sidetrack you there. No, no, that's great. And, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I'll say I also um, may disagree just a bit with Hardy's reading of these opening chapters of First Nephi, um, you know, uh, or at least with the effect of them, because the reality is that in the end, whatever Nephi's intentions, I think many readers still do end up being able to see Laman and Lemuel's point of view. I think, I think a lot of readers do say, hang on, this portrait seems a little bit, maybe a little bit overdrawn. And there must have, they must have had some reasons for what they were doing. So there's a way in which um, I don't know whether Nephi intended that or whether that marks kind of the failure of Nephi's authorial control over this material. But, um, but in some ways, I think we, we do end up sort of saying, well, if I were in Layman Lemuel's position, maybe I would actually sympathize with them in a little bit, in a, in, in a, in a way, right? And Kim Matheson on our last um, episode where we took a deep dive into the text and content of First Nephi made a point that has really stuck with me. And that is that Laman and Lemuel are Nephi's first pupils. Nephi is given um, the promise that if he keeps the commandments, he will become a ruler and a teacher over his brethren. And we see throughout 1 Nephi as he practices becoming a teacher and he grows over time. And in some cases, he's not super successful in being a teacher. But actually, 1 Nephi ends at a beautiful moment where he is successfully teaching Laman and Lemuel. And they come to him and they ask him to explain the prophecies. And he does so in a beautiful way. So Laman and Lemuel, in many ways, are stand-ins for us as the readers, who likewise are hoping to learn from Nephi. So it's important in some ways that we can identify with Laman and Lemuel, at least to the extent that we can put ourselves in the position of a learner and put ourselves at Nephi's feet. Um, hopefully we are a more receptive audience than Laman and Lemuel generally are. Um, as I said, they have, they have their moments where they're able to listen and to learn. Um, more often, of course, they reject what he says. But it's important, at least to the extent that we as readers see ourselves also as learning from Nephi, uh, who is growing into his role as a teacher here in the book of First Nephi. Hey all, my name is Austin Ball. I'm a new addition to the Maxwell uh, podcast team here. I help edit the Book of Mormon Studies podcast. For this episode with Jasmine and Rosalind, their conversation extended beyond the usual podcast length. So uh, we figured that it was too important and too good to edit anything out. And instead we just decided to split it into two regular length episodes. This is um, telling you to go to the next part. You can access it here. And thank you for listening.